and middle management. Uh, often middle management yeah. is where the entire organization, leaders, managers, frontline employees, like you're saying, the, that frozen middle is really key too. Hi, I'm Matt, your host of the CX and Culture Connection, the podcast for CX leaders looking to drive ROI from their investments in CX and culture together. I'm really excited to be here today with uh, Jim Tincher, who's the best-selling author of Do B2B Better. I really enjoyed reading your book and, and doing a book review, Jim, and talking with you about it. I'm excited to have you on the podcast today. I'm glad to be here. Looking forward to the conversation. So, Jim, just to get us uh, started, one of the things I loved in in your book, Do to Be Better, Do Be to Be Better, is this idea of an emotional North Star about understanding the the customer journey and what's driving that peak emotion along the journey. I'd love if you could share a little bit more about what an emotional North Star is and why is focusing on emotion so important, even for B two B companies. Now, I've got to say, in the research I did in support of the book, we did over 200 interviews, that was one that surprised me. Now, I knew connecting financials was going to be part of it. The part of data also surprised me. But really, the concept of measuring emotions in B2B, I hadn't anticipated that. And it found out, it, it makes perfect sense what you hear. You know, our behaviors as human beings, is, we're emotional beings first. We make emotional decisions, then rationalize it afterwards. And so understanding what are those emotions and how they drive the financial impacts we care about, higher loyalty, higher repeat purchase, higher retention, lower cost to serve, understanding that emotions are the drivers of that and that emotions can be measured, that was to me a big finding. It really surprised me. Maybe it shouldn't have. And they've been writing about B2C for years. There's like a seven-year-old article on the Harvard Business Review talking about measuring emotions, but it's always on the consumer level. And it's interesting when I talk to B2B companies, initially they resist this idea that emotions are part of the experience. That you know, B2B, it's all about value and pricing and rational considerations. But we find that's not true at all. That yes, those things matter, but the experience you create leads to an emotional outcome. And that emotional outcome leads to behaviors with financial implications. And so that emotional North Star is determining what specific emotion for your brand best measures the experience and the financial outcomes out of it. In terms of, um, you know, diving just a little further with the audience um, in, and share what connects with me, I find, you know, this is not an either or or something pejorative to say, oh, it's about emotion, therefore it's less squishy and it's not it's not hard nosed business. What we're talking about is understanding what drives trust, what drives connection, what drives ease of doing business. Like all of these things actually are you can translate them to business value more intuitively. But there's also an emotional side. If you're hard to do business with, it creates certain emotions. If you're someone who projects expertise and project and, and is trustworthy and has strong relationships along the customer journey, that has positive emotions. And you can be much more intentional about what the actual emotions you want are and why they're showing up in the experience. It's not it doesn't take away from the insights and analysis of the journey. It actually builds on it. Well, exactly. And Great example. <clears throat> when I first, we were working with Dow on their complaints journey. And when I met with Dan Futter, who's now the chief commercial officer, and he wrote the forward to my book, he told me, Jim, my goal is to create a complaints experience that's enjoyable. And I remember sitting back and saying, well, Dan, I really didn't expect the sentence to end that way. Because they measure effectiveness, ease, and enjoyability. I thought it would end up with like easy or effective. But when you set that as your emotional North Star, your goal is to create an enjoyable experience, that leads to very different outcomes than effectiveness and ease. And Dow has done the analysis that they show that when customers say it's effective to work with Dow, or when they say it's easy to work with Dow, their behaviors don't really change. Maybe fewer complaints, a little bit lower cost to serve. But when a customer says it's enjoyable to work with Dow, First of all, creating enjoyability means Dow has done a great job communicating with them, 
understanding their needs, building great product solutions for them. But then that's what creates the enjoyability. But when they earn enjoyability, they find order velocity goes up. Uh, they find that clients order multiple products, order from multiple business units. And the ultimate home run for Dow is that clients who say it's enjoyable are far more likely to work with Dow to conduct joint innovation, to create new to the world products. And that is what gets Dow jazzed up is the ability to do great innovation. But that doesn't happen unless the clients enjoy working with Dow. Yeah, what you're highlighting is the difference, and you talk about this in the book, between pain points and love points. And just reducing pain points won't create that enjoyability. It'll just make it less, there'll be less friction. It'll be easier to do business with them. But building enjoyment actually requires you to focus on positive experiences in the journey, not just reducing negatives. Could you talk a little bit more about, you know, the differences between pain points and love points. And in your book, you even talk about how it activates different parts of your brain. I thought it was really fascinating. Yeah, and so there's research still going on in that, but the research I've seen is that the parts of the brain that deal with frustration, anger, annoyance, that's a specific part of the brain. When you create an enjoyable experience or you create trust, confidence, those more positive emotions, that activates a different part of the brain. You don't get customers to love you by being less annoying. Yeah, you'll stop chasing them away, and that's good, that's important, but you don't earn the right to do more with them just by being less annoying. And if we look at, for example, the Exum Institute looked at this, and they found that when a customer has a positive emotional experience with you, and then you make a mistake, well, 74% of the time, three out of four times, they'll forgive you for that mistake. But if they have a negative emotional experience with you, that drops to 19%, one out of five. And so by having this positive emotional experience, you essentially inoculate your customers for the inevitable problems that will happen. If we bring in some Forrester data, they find, and I was applying this more in general overall customer experience measurement, they use a seven point scale. And they found that most organizations focus on the one, two, and three and try to get them less negative. But if and found that that's about 80% of customer experience work. But if instead you focus on those neutrals and turn them into positive, that gives you eight to nine times the value as an organization. Because these are the folks who, yes, they'll reduce their cost to serve and they'll be less likely to leave, but they're also ordering multiple products from you. They're also renewing their subscriptions if that's what you have. So many great outcomes. And there also then are recommending others to come with you. But that's really the outcome is that when you create positive emotional experiences, all kinds of great outcomes happen as a result. So what this means in practice is like when people build out personas and customer journeys and then look across the journey to optimize the experience and orchestrate the experience, it's not enough just to focus on where there's pain points in the customer journey, you got to look at where those peaks, not just the valleys, but also the peaks and think about when there's a peak, what is the emotion that's occurring? What I, uh, so what I found really insightful about your book is not only uh, did it make it really relevant for B2B companies uh, and not just consumer companies, I mean, it's in the title, do B2B better, um, but, but also, um, that you emphasize the importance of the peak and not just the valley, and then also being very specific and data-driven on which specific emotions you want in the peak. Well, exactly. So first of all, yes, there's, you're going to focus some of the pain points. You have to get that. But you want to make absolutely certain, first of all, you're not negatively impacting your strong points that you have. And second of all, you want to emphasize where you're creating great connections. If you learn, for example, that your, your account managers have done a great job of understanding customer needs and connecting to them, you have a really strong account management and it's, it's creating great connections with customers, then make sure you do nothing to impact that, but instead accelerate that. We're working right now with a petrochemical company where their, their BDMs are creating great relationships with their customers. So we're saying, how can you even emphasize that more? 
How can we arm them with better data? How can we make sure we take things off their plates? Because that is currently a really strong point in the journey. How do we make it even stronger? You really want to focus on the high points experience because that, as mentioned earlier, that research from the Exum Institute, it buys you forgiveness for the inevitable problems. We cannot create perfect journeys. We want to create the journeys as strong as they can be. And so you really want to emphasize where you're creating great emotional connections today because A, that's usually less expensive. You're investing where you're already strong, but then B, that carries the customer through a number of other areas. Now, I get a lot of pushback on this from people who have read The Effortless Experience. And, you know, I love The Effortless Experience. It's a great book. There's one big issue that nobody thinks about. If you're not familiar with the Effortless Experience, it talks about how making it easy on customers creates more loyalty than creating a wow experience. And that's true until you look at their data and their source and find out the book is entirely based on calls to the contact center. Now, the contact center matters, no question about it. It's a very different part of the experience. If you're out having your say your business development rep or your account manager out talking to the customer, they talk about the kids or the grandkids. That's a very great experience that builds emotional connection. If your customer is down because your products haven't showed up, for example, nobody wants you to talk about the grandkids then. You want to make it during issues of service recovery. Yes, you want to make it as easy as possible. A lot of people, many people have overlearned the effortless experience and applied it to the rest of the journey. Whether you like your data from Forrester, the Exum Institute, or we found from our clients, Dow, UKG, they all say the same thing. An easy or effortless experience only buys you a little bit. It's a strong emotional experience is where you earn loyalty. Well, and if you look across, you know, the broader customer experience landscape, historically, we've had things happening in silos, Jim where you've had the, the call center as one area people are focusing on. You've got the, you know, the in-store on-premise experience, whether B2B or B2C. Uh, you've got the, uh, the sales people engaging with customers. You've got technical sales people. There's all, you know, sales, marketing, and service. There's all kinds of people interacting with the customer, not just the call center. Now the call center can be important, but to your point, and you can learn a lot from the call centers, but if you only focused on mining data from the call centers, as valuable as that is, you would not optimize the entire customer experience. The key is to bring all the pieces together and bridge across those silos. So 100% agree, like let's learn from the call centers, let's improve the call center experience, but you wouldn't optimize the entire journey based on one piece of the journey. 100%. One of the things that surprised me in the research beyond the emotions is also how the change makers. Now, in my book, I identify that a change maker is somebody who can prove their working customer experience creates business outcomes. A customer is buying more, staying longer, interacting in ways less expensive to serve. It's 23% of the population. Uh, data that's been validated by Qualtrics, by the Exum Institute, by um, Customer Think, all show that about one out of four programs can do that. When I started interviewing those great programs, I found they use data very differently. And by data, I don't mean survey scores. I mean operational behavioral data. And to your point, they had these great dashboards that showed the overall customer experience through operational behavioral data. So they could bring the contact center in, but also if you're manufacturing your product availability and delivery, if you're a software company, support cases, um, or uh, issue resolution, onboarding, bring the entire journey together into a dashboard that showed the overall state of the customer experience. In an example, if I could move to B2C just for a minute, we worked with a property and casualty insurance company on the claims journey. Now, it won't shock anybody that one of our findings was the more touches a customer has to have with their insurance company, the worse the outcome. Now, nobody wants to call and say, what's the, re what's the current status of my claim? That's an annoying call to make. It's also an expensive call to receive. And the organization set a goal of one and a half touches per claim. Makes perfect sense. Yeah, we only, you know, they, they'll have to call us once to file the claim. 
We may have to call them back with a little bit of detail, but one and a half is our goal. It's terrific. So we then talked to the different folks in the organization. We found that there were so many different places where these touches could happen that were all isolated. As you mentioned, Matt, they were siloed. And so they could call customer service. They could call the underwriter or the claim adjuster. They could call their agent. When we actually brought together that data from across the customer journey, they learned they averaged 5.7 touches on every claim. And now, first of all, that means they're really annoying customers. That's a lot of touches, but also means there's lots of invisible costs baked into that because those touches are not free. It's interrupting people from their work. It's 20 some dollars for a call to a contact center. They were spending hundreds of dollars per claim, which adds up quickly, and really annoying their clients at the same time. But they had no visibility to that because the CX team was looking only at individual touch points, not at the overall journey. Yeah. So you, if you want to orchestrate the whole journey, you need data across the journey. And if you want to use insights to design a better journey, you need data across the full journey. Uh, it's like looking for your keys under the light because that's where the light is. You want to expand the light to include it, the whole range so you can see everything, right? Um, so. You know, the other thing here, um, uh, just to come back to emotion uh, for a moment, is what you're talking about, too, is that it's getting beyond the product alone. So it's like when you're connecting with somebody, you're, you're finding ways to engage them in the, the relationship and the experience is broader than just the features of the product. In the case of a B2B company, the relationship includes the supply chain and the on-time delivery. It includes the interactions with your people and the claim and their technical expertise and their ability to solve problems. So like you could stretch the definition of product and service to include those other things, but there's also other things where you provide deeper meaning and connection where, so the emotion is much stronger than just fixing the pain. I couldn't, couldn't agree more. And, and thinking holistically around the experience and how do you design an experience that goes beyond just kind of beyond just the product is key. In the case of B two B companies, not just delivering the product, but everything else. Well, exactly. We um, yeah, you know, I mentioned Dow. I can talk more about Dow because they're in the book, um, and so we do a lot of work with them, and we help them map their product availability and delivery journey. And one of the things they found, they'd already measured enjoyability, but they discovered that how they deliver their products, whether they're on time or not, as well as can they say yes to an order had a huge impact on customers' confidence. And so they asked the natural question, can we measure that? Now, one of the things I love about Dow, Ricardo Porta as a CX leader, is they are a very data-focused organization. Now, they have bad data just like everybody else does. And they don't try to get perfect data. They just say, how can we get the data we need at the right points? And so Ricardo came and spoke at our first conference, the uh, first Do Be To Be Better conference. And he spent 25 minutes talking about how he answered one question, which is from a challenging stakeholder, what's the role of inventory in my business and what does CX have to say about it? Well, that's an interesting question. Yes, inventory matters. Businesses don't want to have too much inventory because that means free cash flow is taken away. But customers, if they had their way, that would have enough supply for a year's worth of every customer ordering. And so what's the right mix in there? But so what Ricardo did, first of all, is you can't really combine levels of inventory with customer experience because they're at different levels. So he said, how do we turn that into a customer metric? And in their case, it's availability to promise. So Matt, if you call and you want 1,000 pounds of solvent, can I say yes? And that's the first thing. What he found, first of all, um, is that when that availability to promise drops to a, a certain threshold, it changes the emotions. And specifically, they have a product availability and delivery survey where they ask about your confidence in Dow as a supplier. And when availability of promise drops below a certain threshold, it's not linear, then confidence drops. So you understand that level. When confidence as a uh, and Dow as a supplier drops, does it matter? Well, yeah, because they can show that when it drops again below a certain threshold, 
future orders drop. Now, when future orders drop, it's pretty easy to do the math to see that, okay, revenue and EBIT goes down. And so his response back to that president of the division is that when you let inventory drop below a certain threshold, confidence in Dallas supplier drops. When that happens, future orders drop. And so you are trading free cash flow today for lower EBIT in multiple future quarters. Now, in their case study with Qualtrics, they shared that understanding that trade-off allowed Dow to put the right level of inventory in place. It created a billion dollars with a B of free cash flow. I don't know any better example of customer experience outcomes than a billion dollars of free cash flow, all about understanding customers' emotions and connecting it to the rest of the business data. Very powerful example uh, about what you mean by emotion um, and how it translates to business outcomes. And, um, you know, one, one thing, another thing I really loved in your uh, book, B2B, Do B2B Better, is you talked about making friends with finance and making friends with data science and how CX leaders um, are, you know, learning to speak with CFOs and chief data people and also enroll their team members on helping build out the dashboards and build out the success metrics. Love for you to share more about why that's important and what do some of these leading companies do to build those relationships with finance and data science? Well, that's really the fourth action of a change maker is remind the four are, first of all, to connect deliberately to financials, net revenue retention, customer lifetime value, uh, connect to those. Second of all is measure emotions, create emotional North Star. Third is measure the journey through the operational behavioral data. And the fourth is use deliberate change management, which is where you're talking about now. We did a survey at one point. We asked CX um, leaders, how often do you talk to finance? Uh, the top two answers were once a year and never. And finance is a critical partner, as are operations, as are analytics. Um, let's start with finance and operations. IBM every year asks CEOs, who will you most rely upon in the next year? The CCO didn't make the list, the chief customer officer. The chief experience officer didn't make the list. The chief marketing officer, where many in CX work, uh, was only 18%. The top two with over 50%, they could use multiple, were the CFO and the COO. So if you are not making friends with the CFO or the COO, you're not impacting the C-suite. Um, second of all, when, they, when Gartner asked CEOs, what are your strategic initiatives? The customer came in ninth. The top was growth. Cost control was sixth. That's what the CEO cares about. So you have to be able to connect to those things. That's going to require relationships with analytics, as well as operations, as well as finance. And so Tabitha Dunn, who just rolled off as the um, chair of the board of the CXBA, Customer Experience Professional Association, she spoke at my second Do b to be Better conference. She talks about how she updates her stakeholder maps every quarter. She goes out and she talks to the leaders to understand who is supporting her, who is passive, who is actually antagonistic. And so she can create a stakeholder map. And she actually shares her stakeholder maps with her stakeholders. I, I wouldn't recommend that necessarily, but it works for her. That's fantastic. Um, Roxy Strominger, who next year will be the chair of the CXBA, she's with UKG. Uh, she does a roadshow twice a year to talk to every stakeholder, make sure they understand what's happening, and she's able to meet their needs. Um, when I talk to... Um, uh, Sandra Fornazier was on a webinar recently. She says she spends about 90% of her time interacting with other stakeholders. In fact, we just did a webinar and some research with the CXBA. We looked at what makes a successful customer experience leader. And we found is that coming back to that word, customer experience leader, most are focusing on the phrase customer experience. Because that's how you got to that role. You worked on customer experience. It was great. The great ones focus on the word leader. They're spending the time with fellow leaders. They're making connections. They have a team to do the customer experience work. They're leaders first, customer experience second. I agree with you. Um, you know, in, a number of uh, years ago, I wrote an article in Strategy and Business around um, uh, leadership experience. 
and how companies are um, often will focus on customer experience or employee experience, but they don't spend enough time on the leadership experience, how their leaders show up, how they engage. And your leadership experience actually amplifies your customer and employee experience if the leaders engage in the right way. So I, I and that, in fact, my own book, uh, The CX and Culture Connection, you know, I'm emphasize, and it's the name of this podcast also, I'm emphasizing the CX and culture connection because of the importance of leadership. Your, your, your leaders actually help tap into the culture and help evolve the culture. And if they don't pay attention, that was your fourth principle, right? Culture and change management. If you don't pay attention to this, your CX efforts won't be successful. And if you do, they'll be remarkably successful. Oh, yeah, 100%. Now, Brian Sander is also on the CXP board with me. He's with AAA National. Uh, he gave me the phrase, we do CX on our stakeholders. So the same outcomes you're trying to create from your, your customers, create it for your fellow executives. And you know, what we found is that the once you become a CX leader, it's no longer your job to understand what customers need. Yes, you need to understand that. You have to represent that. But it's really switching around, and it is the voice of the business. It's the business experience which you need to understand because your stakeholders will determine your success. The CFO and the COO, if they are talking about customer experience, they understand how it impacts their metrics, then you're in a golden situation. And you can really make better change on behalf of your customers because you have the two most powerful leaders of your organization speaking on your behalf. But if, like most, you don't talk to finance, you don't talk to operations, then you're probably going to get what you deserve, which is you're going to be in a silo talking about survey scores, and you're not going to have influence on the business. Uh, people listen to me regularly get tired of me talking about, talk to finance, talk to operations. I say, hey, I'll stop talking about it when you start doing it. And I have a lot of people, when I get together for a lunch, coffee, they're embarrassed that, you know, I haven't talked to finance yet. or yeah, I had a great conversation with finance and it's enabled all these downstream impacts. Well, and also, you know, we're talking basically about getting beyond the call center and influencing the whole sales, marketing and service, which you can't influence the whole customer experience with that operation, supply chain, finance, with that all the other parties being involved, too. Um, and I'd, I'd love to bring it back to human beings and behavior again and emotion. Um uh, you know, because you're working with people and not just the company. B2B companies are made up of people. And a lot of the experience you can't completely digitize. There's still human beings interacting with other human beings, especially in B2B. Um, and a lot of times those human beings, um, it's the behavior of how they engage during the experience that actually delivers that emotional response that you want. So you can be very intentional about the behaviors you want and measure them. That's what I actually find really powerful about the CX and culture connection is under, like you say, understanding the emotion, understanding the journey, but then be intentional about the behaviors you want, which are often operations, frontline salespeople, people who are not in the call center, who are in, you know, call centers too, but it's people throughout the organization have that human to human interaction. Oh yeah, hundred percent. And so Roxy Strominger mentioned with UKG, uh, we worked with her a number of years ago and we did journey mapping. She had already determined her emotional North Star. She did quantitative research and found that when customers were confident that they were far more likely to buy additional products, their cost to serve was much lower. Confidence was the key emotion. She actually measures eight, frustration being another. She would not like me to share the other six. but So she has eight emotions she measures on a regular basis. When we did the journey mapping, what we learned is that one of the key interactions that mattered was a support experience. Not a surprise. They're a software company and they do payroll. So if you have a payroll issue, that's a huge moment of truth. And they found that one of the areas that really made a difference was if the support person working with them was perceived as being knowledgeable. I'm very deliberate on that language, perceived as being knowledgeable. It doesn't actually matter how much knowledge they had. Did they come across as knowledgeable? And so she started adding that to the, um, the support survey. 
Another one was, was communication clear? And in each one, she found that when the rep was knowledgeable and when communication was clear, there was a 10x improvement in confidence and a 10x decrease in frustration. It's coming back to those behaviors that are there is can we communicate clearly? Can we communicate in a way that shows knowledge about it? That really creates the confidence, which creates the business outcomes. She has this chain of value. Now, chain of value didn't happen right away. It took her years. It took Dow three years. It took Roxy about three years to be able to create this whole model. But when you have it, well, you have the influence and the organization will respond. What can CX leaders do to um, become those change agents? What do you think are the most important leadership behaviors that the, the CX leader should do other than you know, focus on emotion and build these relationships. Are there other things that you think are really important for leaders to kind of really grow into that role that you're talking about as a change maker? Other than they re- they should read your book, obviously. So in the book, I said two things I use to see if somebody's a change maker. I'm going to alter those. But in the book, what I said is, number one, tell me about your data, I would ask you. And number two, tell me about your dashboards. I want to get a little bit more specific. Because as we've done more research, I thought if I could ask you one question to see if you're a change maker, it would be your internal stakeholders that you rely upon. What are their KPIs? And can you link customer experience to them? Now, first of all, very few CX leaders I've talked to could actually tell me what KPIs their internal customers look at. And but the successful ones can. They can specifically say, if I'm working, for example, with operations, what are the KPIs they care about? Is it calls to the contact center reducing those costs? Or is it um, being able, to, is it orders within lead time? What, what are they being metriced against? Because that's what they care about. They care mostly about being seen as successful in their job. That's their number one concern. If you come to them and talk about net promoter score, they're not going to give you a lot. Of, they'll give you nice lip service. Say, yeah, that's really important. That's fantastic. Internally, they're thinking, but I'm busy doing real business over here. But for example, um, Sam Wegman with Univar, she can show that when they flip a customer from a detractor to a promoter, they're obviously a net promoter score shop, it means two cents per pound in margin, which when you're Univar side, that size, that becomes real money. She takes the time to understand what are the KPIs for my internal stakeholders and how does customer experience impact that? What you're highlighting, Jim, is the data uh, goes beyond just customer listening to include the business outcomes. And they're able to collaborate with other leaders internally to drive those business outcomes. 100%. So it takes some time to make those connections, but it starts with if you can't get the data right away because that will take time. If you can understand exactly what the KPIs are of the people you're trying to influence, you can start with your talk track. And that also will then guide your analysis. Now, the ultimate is if you can actually get the data that they're extended in into your survey platform, so you can look at the connections, that will take time, but you want to work on that. But certainly you can start using the data you have to connect it to what they care about. I'm a huge fan of the ad car change model, that if you want people to change their behaviors, for example, either to use digital from the customer side, or if you want more support from your um, business customers, internal customers, start with making them aware of the need to do that. Then get them to desire to work with you. Then get them to know how to do it, make sure they're able to do it, and keep reinforcing it. Most use an AKA model. Awareness. Hey, our service scores are low. Knowledge. Here's where they're low. Ability. Let me give you some training or explain more. Skipping right over desire. Desire from your stakeholders comes from their KPIs. That's what they're promoted on. That's what they're told they're doing a good job. Start with that. So this is thinking about their emotions. They want to be seen as doing a great job. That's the emotional outcome they're looking for. How can you help them accomplish that? That will take you further than any survey score ever will. The uh, internal 
experience and the employee experience of your leaders, not to, and your all employees in the organization drives your CX too. Hundred percent middle management. Uh, often middle management yeah. is worth the entire organization: leaders, managers, frontline employees. Like you're saying, the, that frozen middle is really key too. Yeah, typically customer experience. Uh, the middle management is where customer experience goes to die, because how do you get to be a middle manager? You do a good job delivering your KPIs, operating well. That's not a fertile ground for thinking about customer experience. And that's, again, why it's important to connect to their KPIs to show that when you have a better experience, for example, let's say you work for a property and casualty company. Can you show that when customers have a better customer experience, they're less likely to challenge their claim amount? Right there, that's real money. Kind of back to them. And that those middle managers, the ones who are getting in your way today, they're the areas in which you need to focus. Jim, I've really enjoyed our conversation. It sparked a lot of great ideas for me. I know it has for the audience too. I hope everyone will like and subscribe the podcast and will uh, definitely go to cxandcultureconnection.com to check out past episodes. Go out and get Jim's book, uh, Do B2B Better. Jim, what can people do if they'd like to um, get in touch with you and continue the conversation? Is that best to follow up on LinkedIn or, or some other way? LinkedIn's a pretty common area. I'll uh, get a lot of connections there. Uh, Jim Tinch, you'll, you'll find me pretty easily. Or Jim at heartofthecustomer.com. Reach out to me and tell me how what you're learn, learning. Thanks, Jim. I uh, really appreciate the conversation and look forward to seeing you at uh, next couple of weeks in CXPA.